welcome. My name is Jennifer Boyat. I am the host of A Conversation with Leading Peacemakers. It is time for our leaders to be peacemakers and for peacemakers to be our leaders. Today, I have the privilege of gathering with some really passionate individuals that I'm excited to hear from. Jacoby Waters is the founder of a Florida-based organization called Young Men of Distinction, and they also have a sister organization, Ladies of Distinction. And he, his mission is to empower young men and um, give help them be inspired to a purpose, uh, specifically higher education, and and thereby have the means for themselves and uh, their loved ones to, um, you know, change social economic circumstances and otherwise, you know, just have a life that has meaning. Jacoby, welcome. Good, good afternoon. How are you doing today? Hi. Thank you for being with us. We also have with us Yadira Ramirez, and she has been passionate about restorative justice in her work throughout her life. And she's also worked a lot with youth, although currently she is involved um, in serving at a couple of California state prisons. And we'll get to hear about her work. Welcome, Yadira. Hello, happy to be here. And we have Ashanti Jones, who's also familiar with uh, restorative justice and is a passionate advocate for um, changing the systems that we participate in. And she does that in a lot of different ways. But currently, she's uh, the criminal justice reform analyst for the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Welcome, Ashanti. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So we're going to hear from Jacoby, and he's just going to tell us kind of how he came to where he's at and what inspired him to do the work he's doing. And um, and then, yeah, tell us tell us what that work is, Jacoby. Uh, thank you for that question. So what made me start Young Men of Distinction was, for one, how I grew up. Uh, I grew up with such a strong foundation. Uh, I had a lot of male role models in my life that were a factor in in my development to the man I am I'm sitting here today. Um, back in 2017, um, I was coaching uh, basketball for high school. And, but I felt like it was a bigger purpose, a bigger need that I wanted to achieve. And I would just realize that just watching TV and watching mass media, just how they were, were portraying young men, especially uh, minority young men. And I was like, I did like the imagery that was being showcased and always being shown. So instead of me complaining, instead of me just just complain about it, just see, just, well, that's just what it is, what it is. Um, I just decided to, you know what, I'm going to, you know, start something that I can help mentor the generation behind me and create a new cycle where, you know, mass media can see like, hey, these, you know, our minority young men, they're bright, they're educated, they're well-informed, so in 2018, I was going to do it with somebody to, to start the group, and then me and that person didn't see eye to eye. Uh, so then that kind of discouraged me, but then just later on in 2018, I was just real bullheaded, and I was like, I was going to do it. Whoever was with me, cool. If not, I just spearheaded on my own. And then in 2019, the original name of the group 
was called Gentlemen of Distinction. And then shortly after, I changed it to Young Men of Distinction because that was the audience that I was trying to reach was Young Men. And I started the group May 3rd of 2019. And since then, just been a real impact in the community here in Florida. Um, I'll, I say as of right now, we have 14 young men that have graduated from Young Men in Distinction. And out of the 14, 11 are currently in college as we speak. Um, the other three are in trade schools. So, you know, to just be able to say that in the midst of COVID and pre uh, post COVID, just the adaptability of the organization and my young men that I've mentored through, they stayed true and true and through, uh, which helped me spawn the girls. Uh, ladies of distinction, uh, because I felt I've done so much with my the young men that you know I wanted to be able to pivot and focus on our young ladies, and so that's where you know my work for young men distinction is inspired by the young men. Uh, without them, um, I tell people there is no organization. Uh, they are the backbone that was made young men distinction and i'm just you know i'm honored to work with them every single day uh just seeing their story being a part of their story is you know i say is my greatest gift to see uh like i said especially i have my six-year-old son soon to be six-year-old that's getting ready to be old enough to be a part of the group full-time uh, he's super excited and ready to be with dad and be with all, you know, I tell him that they will be so his older brothers. So he's just super excited. Um, and that's what, you know, I say young men of stage has really just been that beacon of light as far as and that's why I hope to inspire these young men to be. Awesome. And I think everyone needs a community that's just part of our health. So what do you guys do? Like, do you meet weekly? Um, what are some of the, the ways that you gather or are, uh, make an impact? So we meet uh, bi-weekly. We cur I currently have groups that I meet with after school, and I have groups that I meet with in school. So this year is actually... Um, a big resur resurgent for us because we're at three schools right now, um, one middle school and two high school, and I'm working on a fourth school. And then we have our two groups that meet outside of school. And so all of them I meet with on a biweekly basis. Uh, we touch on different topics, different life skills. So, like, we're going to be touching on our first pillar, which everybody will start with, is on self. Uh, which, that was, like, my number one thing that I want our young men to understand is, you know, being able to love yourself, being able to understand you. And it's okay to do things for the betterment of you starting out. And then as they get older, you know, kind of just adding on, different things but the first thing we we start with is on self uh because i was like i instead of me just telling them things that i already see let me hear what they feel about themselves and then we just start you know we tear it down to build it back up a stronger foundation uh we are big in community because i tell them that you know without the community that help raise us you know there will be no you so we're very big in community service projects. Uh, actually, the end of this year, we have our big tour drive. Uh, this will be our fourth annual, um, as well as we we just do, we do, and we also do a lot of fun things. But I really let the guys dictate how they see the vision of the organization. And that's something I pride myself on is, 
they have ownership in the organization. Thank you. And I'm so glad to hear that because I know that uh, with the uh, women, and there's still lots of room with women too, but we've really started this conversation about loving ourselves, but sometimes I don't hear it as much for young men or um, even non-binary and, and, and some of the other experiences that people have. So we still have a long ways to go on that self-love and self-care bit. So I'm glad to hear that. Yadira, tell us a little bit about you and about your work. Yeah, um, thank you, Jacoby. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, your work sounds similar to kind of how I transgressed into my work. So, um, yeah, lots of parallels here, which is really dope. Um, so I was born and raised in um, a really small farm town where maybe most of y'all get your lettuce and strawberries um, from Salinas, California. And in California, it's um, unfortunately, uh, aside from the fact that there's just um, fields of really yummy nourishment, um, it's unfortunately also just um, heavily known for gang violence. And so that was something that I grew up with uh, my whole life um, and around. And, um, you know, it. I, I had the privilege to be able to move and, and uh, go to college. And I'm really grateful for that experience um, because it allowed me to step into resources that I didn't know was available in, in such a small uh, farm town. And, um, <clears throat> Once I got to college, um, I started working with the youth, um, specifically around restorative justice. We would hold um, programming during the school day. So instead of students going to see the principal, they would come and see me um, to support them in um, just, you know, uh, whether the teacher was having a challenge with them in the classroom or um, maybe they're having a challenge on the playground with another student, whatever it may have been, instead of them, you know, um, taking direct punitive action, they would come to see me and uh, we would talk about it. We'd have a dialogue and um, and then after school, we would hold programs at different um, locations um, around um around body, mind, and, um, and emotional wellness. And this is kind of where the RJ would be integrated. And it was just really, really inspiring to see the youth hear and, and be in practice of um, RJ uh, ideals and, and practices and just get it right away and not even question it. And um, and then to see them, you know, be in an embodiment of um, not really needing, you know, somebody else to facilitate or mediate when a conflict comes up and just like immediately knowing how to handle it. And so that was really, really incredible to, to witness. And then moving forward, I, um, you know, continued um, in my educator role and supported with um, um DEI training with teachers and holding um, restorative justice practices with parents at schools and students. And, um, and so it was, um, you know, I, I really loved it, but I was also a teacher at the same time while also wearing all these hats. And so I think, you know, I was an educator for almost 10 years. And so I got to a point where um, it felt fulfilling, but I just felt very, um, just very physically and emotionally drained. Um, and I just needed to take time away and, and um, give myself um, um, a break. Um, and so um, in the midst of me um, figuring out what's next, um, a friend of mine 
invited me into a prison um, to do gardening work because that was um, the one of the roles that I took on as an educator was a garden teacher. And so um, there's this program called Insight Garden um, Program where we go into um, different prisons here in California and we revitalize the gardens out on the yards. And um, so I was at Solano Prison and San Quentin and um, that happened over the course of a summertime. Um, and while it was very hot, it was so much fun. Um, and that's still, um, something that I'm active in. Um, however, you know, now that I'm in a full-time position, it, I don't get to go as often as I'd like, but we would go um, once a week. And um, it, it felt like a, you know, it felt like a portal, honestly, just um, being created on the yard, surrounded by these huge cages, but at the same time, like um, revitalizing the ecosystem. You know, I remember going in and there being, um, absolutely, um, there was no live plants or, um, or any insects or anything like that. And slowly, but surely they started to, to come. And I think it also just led for a really sacred container for moving and talking about trauma and, um, and really just sitting with a plant and, or weeding or whatever it was. And just, um, those conversations just naturally started to happen. And, um, so going down the line, I ended up, um, finding a, um, job, um, around restorative justice specifically, um, called the Insight Prison Project. And um, so not to get confused with Insight Garden Project, they were once um, partners, uh, but this was years and years ago. Um, and that has been really, really incredible because, um, you know, there's, I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty dense. Um, we're in eight facilities here in California and one juvenile facility. And um the whole premise of the program, it's um, uh, 52 weeks long, but it can extend to further. Um, it really just depends on the number of people in our cohort. Um, we typically are anywhere between 12 to 15 people in our cohort. Um, we're in one women's facility, but the rest are men's. So I've mainly just worked with men. Um, and um, <clears throat> We uh, the way it works is we we go through a curriculum that's um, split up between so many weeks. And so the first part of the curriculum um, is we have them um, share their crime impact statement. And so prior to this, we do hold interviews because we want to make sure that they're even able to talk about um, the details of of um, their case and also um, you know, they might be in a resentencing or or maybe there there might be something that they're unable to talk about their crime, but a really big part of this program is that they come in talking about the details of their crime and um, are essentially ready to take accountability um, for the harm um, that they caused, but also um, being willing to understand and unpack that they too have experienced harm and are also victims as much as um, you know, the person that they've impacted. And so um, we, uh, we go through curriculum around uh, the self. So we talk about different communication styles, different attachment. We talk about trauma, ancestral trauma. Um, then we move through um, things like forgiveness and grief. Um, we talk about um, our relationship to power, um, parenting styles that we may have grown up with. Um, and uh, all of these um, conversations are paired with activities. I would say the, the most impactful activity would be the timeline um, of events activity where we essentially ask them, you know, um, what were you like before you experienced um, trauma? Uh, what was going on for you um, within your first experience of trauma and how did that impact you afterwards? Um, and I feel like that is usually a conversation that gets 
um, pretty in depth because, you know, these are questions that I think a lot of people in society don't even bother asking folks that are, that are incarcerated. And, you know, um, I come from a family of, um, that has been system impacted and I currently have family that's incarcerated. And so, um, not only has this supported, um, you know, the folks inside, but it's also supported me in my own personal, uh, life because, you know, I think there's a lot of layers to, um, to the carceral state. And I think there's a lot of, um, you know, um, we've been indoctrinated into a punitive system. You know, our, our workplaces are punitive, our school system is punitive, even our family dynamics are punitive. And really there's, there's a whole other way that we can be with each other that I think restorative justice and transformative justice really embodies and, and, and shows us. And so, um, you know, um, we have supported um, over hundreds of men and, um, you know, we have very long wait lists for folks inside. And we also have outside facilitators that come and support and they undergo a training um, for, for two weeks before going into the prisons. And, um, and um, we also have inside facilitators, which is really helpful because, you know, I think a lot of time with programming, um, we only get to go once a week. And so um, the idea of the inside pro, um, facilitator is uh, they go through the program and they are then identified by the outside facilitator that, you know, they were really incredible throughout the program. They um, did, you know, the work in order to really show that um, they have um, taken accountability, have shown more empathy, you know, all the things that the board of parole like looks for. Um, and they then become the insight facilitator. So if there are any questions that come up um, during the week or any support, any like processing that's needed, then the men in the cohort can go to the inside facilitator and, um, and get support in that way until the outside facilitators come. Um, and, uh, but yeah, out, out of, we've, we've supported hundreds to thousands of men and, um, I know 10 have returned to prison, but none of them have returned for causing harm to another person. And, um, most of the men that we work with are, um, LWAPs, um, life without parole or, um, just lifers. Um, and many, many of our men have actually gone home. Um, one of our men is actually going home today and he just finished up the cohort. Um, so, you know, it's been, um, it, it feels like uh, really the work that they're doing is like shadow work, just deep um, reflecting. And, um, you know, ironically, I, I talk with them about how, you know, y'all are doing this work and it is so inspiring because nobody's doing it out there. <laughs> Once y'all get out, like it's it's really difficult to um, come across people that are in these active conversations and reflections and unlearning and relearnings. And so just also preparing them for when they do get out um, that it can be really easy to go into default you know, but there are cycle breakers and, and that's what, why they're doing this. And, um, if not for them, then for the future generations, you know? And so, um, so yeah, I feel, I feel deeply humbled and, and honored to be a part of this work and, um, and, um, yeah, just, um, really excited to, to hear, um, all the parallels that are existing here and, um, yeah, love. I, I, I think, um, you know, RJ and TJ can exist in a vacuum sometimes. Um, and so, so I wonder how it can expand, you know, like um, other worlds can merge. They're also doing this work across, you know, these imaginary borders and, um, and just, uh, yeah, be in a process of um, ultimately just taking care of each other, you know, because I think that's all, what we're really here to do. Um, and I really feel like RJ and TJ um, is a very strong foundation in that. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Yadira. And and instruct me just a little bit. So RJ is restorative justice. And what does TJ stand for? TJ is transformative justice. There's like, oh, um, there are, 
variations of uh, where they have a lot of parallels, uh, but some will say that it's different. Um, but um, my the premise of, of our work at um, Insight Prison Project is um, restorative justice. Um, but there's also a lot of work around TJ, specifically here in Oakland. Um, so I like to just say both. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have to learn my acronyms. <laughs> Ashanti, share with us how you've come to your calling and what you are in the middle of these days. Yeah, thanks. Um, so thank you first for the opportunity to share space with um, you all today. It's been um, really inspiring to me to hear here from both Jacoby and Yandira. Um, Yandira, I was in Oakland last year um, looking at some of the restorative justice um, facilities that we can and kind of the spaces and trying to figure out how we can employ some of that in New Jersey. So um, right in line with you with restorative and transformative justice. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the context of this conversation, you know, my world, like my work um, and the world of peace or I'd say justice, right, um, is what I kind of prefer to call it is really about interrupting narratives, right? It's about um, achieving equity and resisting, right? Resisting the status quo and kind of what we've been taught is what's normal, right? So resistance to me is my path to peace because at the end of this, right? At the end of life, at the end of, you know, my work, you know, the goal is equity, right? For all people in all facets of human life. You know, I'm really grateful to be able to do that work with my colleagues here at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. And so like the Institute itself, right? We really focus on pulling people from the margins and into power. Right. And I deeply align with that, like myself. Um, and so we have three pillars here, our economic justice pillar, which focuses on like closing the racial wealth gap um, and addressing, you know, those issues of inequity. And we also have democracy and justice, which focuses on like really addressing the inherent um, issues with disenfranchising people. Right. When you distance them from their own personal power, right, by not having the right to vote or not be having the right to sit on a jury. Um, and so we really focus on restoring those rights to folks um, with our democracy pillar. And then criminal justice, which is where I'm situated, um, really uh, focuses on those inherent issues within policing and juvenile justice. Um, and so right now, my focus is primarily on juvenile justice, right? Pursuing an end to New Jersey's youth prisons. Um, we happen to have the worst racial disparity rates in the nation. Um, when it comes to incarcerating kids, we, they're, the in, racial disparity rate right now is 18 and a half. So black kids are 18 and a half times more likely to be incarcerated for the same crime as a white kid. Um, and it tells a story, right, about like who we consider to be children, who do we consider to be worthy um, of justice, right, of a second chance. Um, and so while we aim to close the prisons, we also try to remedy um, kind of some of the underlying behaviors by increasing res resources for community-based pathways, right? So addressing youth behavior without altering their lives, right? Um, and so one of those pathways is restorative justice, right? So similar to Yadira and all of the sentiments that she expressed about like the shadow work and um, how deeply impactful restorative and transformative justice can be, um, I align with that completely. Um, in 2021, we actually been advocating and writing toolkits on how to do restorative justice, right? Um, how do you build a hub, right? How do you build a safe space within your community to allow folks to kind of process that relationship between being harmed and having harmed, right? And so um, our advocacy actually landed with New Jersey um, passing and allocating $8.4 million, right, to launch pilot programs, right, for restorative and for restorative justice hubs in four cities, right, and these four cities are where the most youth are being funneled into the juvenile justice system, and so at the core of that, we recognize that the crime and punishment model that we employ to address people's responses to poverty and mental health and other social issues, right, it further agitates our society. It doesn't do anything to heal it, and so, you know, the, the crime and punishment model, it's so ingrained in our methodology that we really, really can't see another way, right? And so um, I know that you're, dear, you're doing work like after people are already adjudicated in prison. And so our goal is to keep them from entering in the first place, right? The adults that end up in the juvenile justice system, nine times out of 10, we're likely in the 
juvenile justice system at some point or have had some sort of justice involvement. Um, and so it's really imperative that we stem the tide, right? And so restorative justice in our sense is that other way, right? It is the opposite of the crime and punishment model. It helps us strip the mechanics of the crime, right? And we what we have considered to be um, you know, the harm. So we can actually see the person. We can actually see the issues, right? And we can actually craft a path forward, something that's co-created, right? There's no sentencing commission, you know, there's just, I understand that I harmed you. I understand why you harmed me. How can we fix this, right? Um, and so that person-to-person -person experience really translate into community cohesion, right? And it reduces our reliance on arrest and incarceration, thus transforming our communities, right? And so um, I know I get a little excited talking about restorative and transformative justice just because it is not a new concept, right? This is something that you know we have been practicing as a society informally in many ways. Um, but we haven't standardized that, right? And I think that there are definitely opportunities for us to um, exist outside of the crime and punishment model. Um, and in terms of like what brought me to this work and how I got here, right? I'd have to say this work kind of chose me or maybe society has guided me to this work, but I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. I currently still live in New Jersey, and my story is not remarkably different, right, from the thousands of other Black children who grew up in the projects, who had one or more absent parents, who were in foster care, or disconnected from community, right? Um, we kind of all had that experience, um, you know, in my city growing up in the 90s. And so when I realized, though, that, like, my work had to be people and justice-centered, I had to recognize that like, even though my experience was the same in my little community, you know, and the people around me, it was vastly different from those who didn't look like me, right? Or those who lived in places that were more wealthy, like Montclair or Wayne, right? And so the first time that I ever entered a house, like that had a front door that opened into a private residence, right? I was 12 years old. I never knew that home homes didn't have elevators or weren't in a projects or everyone didn't live in buildings. Like I had no idea you could just turn a key and be in your home. Right. And so that was a concept that really helped me understand that there are deep inequities here, you know, and so there are deep racial and class divides that really do persist in New Jersey and were the foundation for all of my core memories. Right. And so I moved around quite a lot. Um, as a kid too. And so I attended three elementary schools, um, two middle schools and three high schools, right? In all different areas across the state. And so I saw stark differences in the way I was educated, the way I had access to opportunities, my social life, um, how te teachers responded to me, the opportunities I was given, right? It differed in every single one of those spaces. And it had a lot to do with the racial and class makeup of the cities, right? And so I wrestled a lot with what my path would be. Like I started out wanting to be an educator, right? I wanted to pour into kids the same way um, that my educators had poured into me, right? I was always affirmed in spaces where I was receiving education, right? And so I realized that one, I was not situated to <laughs> deal with children, with 25 children, with like all their issues. Um, like it just wasn't my calling, right? I didn't feel like I was fully equipped um, to take up space in that way. And so I realized what I wanted to do was really bigger than that. And so I was led to be considered to be a social worker, right? But I thought that I'd get into child welfare, saying that I fixed the system, right? That I would uh, stop kids from, you know, <laughs> going to foster care and losing their families. But then I recognized that the issue was even deeper than that, right? By the time I finished college, I was in an entirely different headspace, right? I started to consider my entire life course, Right. And all of the personal experiences that I had um, and had them be situated in social context. So, like, I had to think about, like, the year I was born, 1992, were the Rodney King riots. Right. When I was eight, 9-11. Right. And there were waves of Islamophobia. I still remember that. Right. At 17, police killed 70 year old um, Ayanna Jones. Right. And by the time I got to college, I've lived through Trayvon Martin, <laughs> Michael Brown, Tamir Bryce, right? And all the host of others who had experienced police violence. And while I was kind of floating through time, like as a teenager, not really focused on these things, my perspective changed immediately. And while 
thought I was in a like in a college context because I was a budding adult. Like I'm expected to vote. I'm expected to like one day enter the workforce and be a part of this society. And I don't have the privilege to blindly course through life. These issues that had developed my social context throughout my life would impact my son. If one day I decided to be a mom, which I am now, right? I'd have to consider that his experience with police officers or with, uh, you know, in education and everything will be vastly different than someone who was white, right? And so I had to say one day, you know, I will be a mom. There was a lot of fear and anxiety that came along with that because I was like, how do I protect him from everything? <laughs> You know, um, I realized that as I got older and decided to drive, I could be on the wrong side of police staff, right? And we have some deeply entrenched racism um, that's embedded in our institutions that could write my tragedy. And it didn't take me more than three months in graduate school to say, I'm going to do policy. Yes, I'm a social worker, but I'm going to do policy because I think that there are ways for me to put the humanity back into law um, for us to view people not as just constituents, but as like human beings, right? We should we have a shared experience here. Um, and so now I get to take all of those experiences and take, you know, all of that perspective and pursue peace through justice, right? I get to share with New Jerseyans and beyond, right? That even with privilege, you, you will never know true peace, right? As long as others are oppressed. And it's good work and I'm proud to do it. You know, um, as history has written the stories that we're living out today, I hope that like my work, um, you know, pursuing justice can even be a piece like of the cornerstone um, that creates someone else's vibrant or viable future. So that's kind of where I am and how I got here. <laughs> so beautiful. You're also courageous. I was going to ask you, Ashanti, so as a po policy analyst, are you working with decision-making bodies there in the city or the state? I guess it would be the state. Yeah, so um, we do work with legislators. We do work with the governor. We do work with the attorney general. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, and so our first order of business is to work with community. Um all of the policy solutions or ideas that we have are deeply ingrained by how these things show up on people's doorsteps, right? We encourage, because again, like at the very beginning of this, I was talking about like the Institute tries to move people from margins and into power. That's what we try to do. We try to engage them on these issues to understand like what exactly are, how exactly are you impacted by juvenile justice, right? You know, how, what are the, the deeper issues here and how can we pursue policy change um, in order to ensure that doesn't happen to you again or any other, anyone else? And so, and then we take those ideas, right? It's all situated from community and we take all those ideas and generate our campaigns and policies. And then we do work with um, those who are, who have legislative power, not our power, but, you know, legislative power um, to be able to, to get some of that work done. Uh, awesome. Um, and uh, I feel like there was, are you feeling like they're hearing you or is it an uphill battle, a little bit of both? I just sometimes feel like where we're at in the movement towards some of these peace and justice, I guess. I do feel that we are being heard. However, I think that a, a lot of this will take a lot of narrative shifting. Um, folks can't understand not living in a society where people are arrested, right? Not living in a society where you don't, there's crime, there's punishment, like this, you do something wrong, you get punished for it, right? That is just how we have always lived life. And so it's difficult for people to think about what, what happens after that, right? Um, folks are afraid, you know, it's a lot of narrative changing though, but I do feel like we're hurt because we, we do get engaged on these, you know, issues a lot from, you know, folks in power. Um, but it's, it's hard, you know, it is hard work, um, cause politics are politics. They are what they are. Um, and so, you know, political aspirations can sometimes get in the way of what folks are willing to do. Um, also the political climate can get in the, in the way of what folks are willing to do. But, um, I, I don't know if it's so much as of whether we're being heard or whether we're going to stop trying to be heard. And I think that that's the important part. We're not going to tr stop trying to be heard. Indeed. Okay. Um, 
Gosh, there's so much. Um, I'm actually going to, I think that um, some of you might actually have better questions than even me <laughs> because you get to work with this stuff every day. Um, so do any of you have any uh, questions for each other or, or a larger question we can dive into? Is anything coming through for any of you? And I, I know that uh, I think so, something that's coming through with that I'm hearing is that narrative piece that the how we're how we're talking about ourselves and other people, and both individually, personally, and also in our communities, also in our when it gets to the part where we're making policy, and. Um, I feel like changing minds and hearts are is like 90% of the road. Cause once that is, then everybody's like, Oh yeah, we should make a law like this. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if anybody wants to riff on that as well. Um, trying to think of, of a directed question for that though. Um, I have I have a question for you, Jacoby. Um, do you get to talk with community leaders and decision makers, and how are they hearing this? And how is your work with them? Is this uh, do you work mostly in the city then, probably the city level, but or or not? What how how do you work? Um, I mainly work with within the community. Uh, when I first started the group. I thought to get my name out there, I had to partner with elected officials. Uh, but I realized that, you know, now almost five years in, that my impact is more greater with really putting my hands within the community to make more change. Um, like with uh, the young men that I currently serve that have graduated, so I speak to all 14 on a consistent basis and some of them still live here locally so you know they're you know they're 18 19 they're getting ready to start you know gearing up to vote um i kind of you know i educate them on their rights and you know they do ask me personal questions like in regards to that uh but i very i steer away from putting a lot of my personal beliefs in them um, because like I said my thing is to help them believe in themselves so to answer your question I mainly work with the community but if what knowing what I know now I would have started with community first and trying to uh, trying to use elected officials to get our the group more noticed within the community makes sense yeah I'm, go ahead sorry. go ahead yeah no i i i love your reflection there that you know you should have started with community first and then because i sometimes something that i always run into sometimes is that folks seem to forget that elected officials work for us right um that they are elected put into power in order to work in our interests, right? And so when you get a group of people together who have an interest, who care about something deeply, it's easier to move the legislator, right? Um, or to figure out whether or not that's even the route you need to take, right? And so um, I know we sometimes, and that has a lot to do with our conceptions of power too, right? You think like you get close to the mayor, you get close to your senator or your representative and you have your, there's an alignment with power, but we forget that we're also powerful right and that they have power because we gave them <laughs> power um and so that collective vote right put that person in power then what does that say about us together right and so i really love that that juxtaposition um and your reflection able to like um do you foresee yourself being able to do what you just said you know put community first and then engage legislators are there any issues that are coming up for you that can possibly be solved through policy uh so well here in here in florida uh, our governor is <laughs> is uh 
causing the ruckus. I'm a, I'm gonna say that, um, especially with uh, with African Americans, as far as like you know, they just proved not too long ago that they're gonna teach middle school kids that slavery was a benefit, and for me, um, as an individual, um, I feel like that's that's crazy. So in my mind, I go more into as I've stepped in my role as you know being a founder of a mentorship program, but I've also viewed myself more so now as a change agent. Because like hearing things like that now, like I said, my my age of thirty four, I would have never thought about none of these things in my twenties and in my teens. But now it's like my mind has gone conscious into what can I do with the platform I have with my nonprofit to be that beacon of light within my community? Do I have to start really, you know, because my guys are African-American. Majority of the boys in the group are African-American. Do I need to start teaching them about their history the right way Versus how the school systems get ready to start teaching to these these uh, African American young men that's road that's running around because I don't want them to get that misconception that slavery was a benefit. Um, uh, so for me, it's like I'm starting to move more. If I want to see the change that I want to see, I have to start putting more action. And you know, let my actions speak more for itself. If politicians get around, that's great. But then I go into the mode of challenging them, like, what is your platform? Like that's why I educate my 18, 19 year old guys now is we all get ready to vote in 2024. Don't just vote for popularity really look at the platform that they're running on because at the end of the day, you have the power. You put them in power. So, um, like I told them, <laughs> and I'm very transparent, um, my first time voting was for Obama's first and second term, and I told them then I was not educated on voting. I mainly voted for Obama because he was a black man. That was it. Wasn't educated. But after that, I started to really, like, I take my time now with voting, really study their platform, and really look and see who I vote for and if they're really following to their platform or they're just saying stuff just to get it office. And I just wish more people would start really taking it to heart of what is their platform? What are they really running for? How do they benefit my benefit me in the space I'm in in the uh this space that I'm in. Thank you. You know, um sometimes we think that democracy happens every two years or every four years when we all go to the ballot box. But vote actually means voice and that voice can be every day. Um you know, or, you know, it, in fact, the most important part of it is not at the ballot box. It's everything that is, um, that we, that we say and do and try to change. And then, and then there becomes those flashpoints, but uh, everything, that voice is constant. It's not just on a piece of paper somewhere and including people's voices and centering people's voices. And that's, uh, that's, um, that that to me is how our society should be going. <laughs> Yadira, what's coming up for you? Any further thoughts as you're listening? Um, no, I I really appreciate just like the um, reflecting on the different challenges that can exist in this work because I think while there's a lot of reward, um, you know, realistically there there are things that um, might prevent us from doing this work sometimes and. Um, you know, I've been, I, I've been in reflection as well around, um, 
how, because I, I identify as an abolitionist. And so it's really interesting in this work. Um, and, you know, being in Oakland um, and organizing out here, there's a lot of abolitionist work out here. Um, but, you know, as I've gotten deeper into, into prison work, ironically, um, a lot of a lot of the men will tell you that they don't believe in abolition. And I think that's really interesting because I think most of the time, um, a lot of like the people that ride hard for abolition, um, for abolition um, are not system impacted or they come from privilege um, um, or they don't and they have been system impacted um, through their family. But to then hear from people that are incarcerated um, that they don't believe in abolition, it's been an interesting dialogue because I've also gone back and forth with myself um, working within an institution. And I also understand, you know, um, and the men understand themselves that they're, they are institutionalized as well. Um, but, you know, just thinking about how um, this doesn't necessarily further the abolitionist agenda because, you know, um, it's still feeding into programs that are supporting the carceral state to continue, um, continue on. And so, um, so that that's something that I think I have an internal challenge with, but I always really enjoy getting into a dialogue with men around this because, you know, a lot of them will say that, like, yes, we're, we're doing this work, but this doesn't mean all of us inside are ready for this work. And, um, and that's just the reality. And so we've talked about what that could look like, um, you know, uh, as far as, um, you know, I think we can all agree that people don't belong in cages and the, the conditions in prisons are absolutely inhumane. And um, they, they, I think they should just cease to exist, but, um, you know, some um, folks have shared with me that there has to be a space where people can um, be able to have programming and have access to resources and um, and be able to be in the accountability process um, and not necessarily be ostracized completely from society like, you know, the prison system does, but at least giving them a timeline of, like, listen, this is this is what was done and this is how we're going to do it moving forward um, in order for you to um, to just be the most healed version of yourself that you can be um, despite the harm that has been caused. And um, so that's something that I think about a lot um, because I do want to honor a person's lived experience, you know? Um, I think that's so valuable and it's like, who am I? Someone that's never, I've, you know, I, I have proximity to a lot of people that are incarcerated, but I personally have never been incarcerated. So I don't understand the full scope of that, you know? Um, and, um, but, you know, um, really similar to like what Ashanti shared earlier around, um, this is a, restorative justice, transformative justice, this is something that has been practiced for generations. You know, this is a, a deeply indigenous practice. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's something to say around when a community comes together to hold somebody accountable, but to support them in that accountability opposed to just like cutting them loose and then just forgetting them, um, you know, so, um, that is something on, on at least on the scope of of challenges that I feel like I I come um, eye to eye with a lot of the time, um, and then also just dealing with CDCR. That institution in itself is just really gross. It's really gross, and so to run program it it can be really challenging because a lot of time, you know, um, the I think the employees without a doubt need to be. Um, doing this work because a lot of them um, are inside uh, not to um, support the folks that are um, inside. They're there to um, cause more harm to them. And so that also feels, I'm just like, you know, um, they go have to go through all these trainings, right? But 
um, yeah, I'm like, what, what could it look like for, um, for the CEOs and the warden and, you know, all these top down decision making people um, to go through a training like RJ. And so um, we're actually flirting with that idea um, in my program um, with uh, California Men's Colony. We spoke with the warden and we asked him if we can come for like a training um, for one of their meetings. And he was open to it, which I was really surprised by, especially in uh, in that area, uh, San Luis Obispo, it's a predominantly white area, not that progressive. Um, so yeah, just trying to, um, you know, I think what Ashanti shared, like how people aren't fully ready to, um, to think about what to do outside of, um, arresting someone and punishing someone. Um, but I think, um, you know, the more that we can like integrate into these spaces where there is a power dynamic happening and there are these top-down decision-making um, decisions happening, um, how we can also um, support those that are on that very extreme spectrum of like, absolutely not, can't imagine not having prisons, um, how we can really shift their their level of consciousness, their, their, um, their belief system in that. I think that's going to be a uphill battle, but um, I think that's also um, the other part of of all of this. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think when whenever we talk about this, and again, I use the word peace, but whenever we talk about these movements and changes and becoming humanity again. <laughs> um, it's never just one thread, right? We're kind of focusing on a couple of threads here, but you know, it, you think, well, we will solve it this way, but we've got to do the education too, and the families and the medical and the, you know, so, and every, if there's someone in all of these spots, and which is why I do this. There's always that someone showing, shining the light in the, these places, but these are all interconnected. So it's like, this is getting this way, this is going this way, oh, we got it back, and then we got to go back this way, you know? So it's never just one thing, oh, and we're all going to be finished, and it's all going to be peaceful by Tuesday, you know? It's this interconnected thing that we're doing. And I I think, the other thing I thought, you know, I think I'm an abolitionist too, but probably like you say, it's like I, it, the, I'm not really a stakeholder. So other than in as a person in the society, you know, it matters to me as a person in the society. Um, I think abolition is inevitable. I just think it's when and how long. I think we're done. And with that, it's just, and I think the people that have to grow the most are actually the people outside of the prisons. I mean, we all do, but we, because we have to, it's easy to say, well, you're out of sight, out of mind. And, but what, what would it be to be the kind of person that would be willing to have the energy to engage um, so that we're doing something different? You know, the future is calling, not the past. <laughs> the future is calling, which is these beautiful realities that we're all creating. Anyone else have any questions or thoughts coming up for them, Ashanti? Well, I've loved this. I think what we'll do now is maybe just some parting parting words. And uh, maybe, um, I don't know, advice may be too strong of a word, but some kind of message or thought, maybe if you could put a megaphone on something, what would it be? And uh, yeah, Jacoby, what would be your bang of megaphone? My megaphone mes message to everyone is, but it's pertain mainly to the adults when it comes to our youth. Be that beacon of light for our youth. Be that change that you want to see, because remember the generation that's behind you, they're looking at you and watching your every move and be that source of just 
information and also just be able to relate to our youth and just strip away old ideology and just really open your mind to just what our youth have to say because contrary to popular belief, our youth is very wise as much to the degree of social media, but our youth is very wise to just take the time to listen and be able to just be that that beacon of light. So that's my megaphone message. Awesome. Thank you. Yadira? Um, my megaphone message would be to start those conversations that can be hard. Um, specifically around um, just harm or conflict. Um, Cause I do feel like a lot of this, um, you know, I think as like black and brown folks, we didn't grow up with these resources, with these languages, with these, um, even the space to have these conversations. Um, and, and so I think it can be really powerful when that can happen at home. And so, um, you know, I think we um, hold on to a lot and we're taught to hold on to a lot and not really process it. And so, yeah, um, you know, I think when conflict comes up, sometimes like um, people can shy away from, from um facing it but also um I see it as an invitation to be closer I I really value my my um relationships where I've had conflict because I feel like it has made us closer and and just kind of develop a different level of respect for one another and um I think um yeah, I think being able to just be in those difficult conversations and hold each other in accountability is actually um, a vehicle for for liberation and and for love. And um, a book that has supported me in in understanding that more uh, is uh, "Conflict Is Not Abuse." Um, I'm blanking on the name of the author, but I definitely recommend it. Um, and uh, Yeah, just ultimately, I think um, having more tenderness and awareness for people's processes and just um, understanding that we, um, we're all still learning and unlearning. And um, I think it's only right that we um, can apply that, you know, to anybody, uh, not just ourselves, but also people that have been inside for years and uh, they also can change and, um, and recognizing that just like how we weren't the same person we were last year. Um, more often than not, the folks inside are also not the same person that they were last year. And so to hold grace for that. Awesome. I looked that book up real quick. It's Sarah Shulman is the author. So I just put that on my book list. <laughs> Ashanti, what is your message? Um, I guess my message is that um, we sometimes operate, you know, as an individualistic society that we just live in this silo where it's just about us, but there's a reason why we're not on a world by ourselves, right? Um, we need each other, you know, to thrive. In order to really have a full life, we have to take responsibility for one another. And one of the things that I think it's really difficult for us to do, like when we're having this conversation about abolition and narrative changing, um, is because we view things, you know, on a scale. Something is either good or bad. And we do the same thing when we do it with justice and peace, right? Someone's worth this while someone isn't, right? And I don't think that's the way that we need to um, operate. We share this human experience, right? And um, we have to stop, um, you know, trying to attach peace to worth, 
right? We have to stop trying to attach justice to worth. Just because someone's serving 25 years or 30 years, they made they made a decision that landed them there. Okay. We have to stop saying that person is not worthy to live a full life once they're home. We have to stop cutting people off um, from society and from all that life has to offer. Um, you know, and I, I'm hoping that we each can take stock and have honest conversations with ourselves, you know, about this because no one should have to fight for the ability to be seen um, or to live freely. Um, I'm often inspired by like all of the change makers that I know um, and even the ones from history, right, who've spent their lives you know, fighting and resisting injustice, trying to prove their humanity to people, right? And while I'm inspired by them, I'm equally bothered that so much of their human experience here has been spent in this agitated state, right? Do we all not deserve rest? And so I just, my kind of call to action is for folks to really just take stock of the ways in which we participate in that cycle, the ways in which we kind of put our blinders on and kind of just focus on ourselves and what's immediately impacting us um, without taking much stock into the implications of our actions and our belief systems um, and just kind of view people as people. Love. And, and what I hope that we're continuing to go toward is, I think some of our responses in the past that I'm talking about deep history well, also yesterday, but coming up from deep history, um, when we've had challenges, when we've met different people different than us, when we've had conflict, when we've had even harm, when we've had these things historically, one of our responses is to cut off the community, which is what prison is as well. And with, I think the, the idea that the fear of being cut off would cause someone to get back in line and and get fixed and come back to the community. But there's so many holes in that. But I think what we're trying to do, and I'm, what I would, my message would be is um, to, when when these things happen, because they will, we will have conflict. We will uh, hurt each other. Um, that, that that is done still within community. Like, in fact, it's, it causes the community to surround you more to say, like we've been talking about with the restorative justice and that the power of those conversations um, that that community doesn't break. And in fact, we get, like, like Yadira just said, we can get back to even maybe a stronger place. And we can do that on all kinds of levels. We can do that very personally. We can do this as a nation. Uh, as you can tell, I'm always very hopeful that we can that we can get there. Um, and I just hope we do it sooner than later. That's that's what I hope. Thank you again very, very much um, for bringing your perspectives. And I'm so glad that I'm sharing a planet with all of you. And uh, thank you for the listeners for joining us. And we will see you again for another interview sometime in the future.